On today's Western Conference Tuesday edition of Locked On NHL, Jonathan Taves taking a break. Is he done for good? Plus, if you could be NHL commissioner, what would you change in the rule book? And we'll look at the 10 most improved teams in the West on today's episode. Your Locked On NHL, your daily podcast on the National Hockey League. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome into a Western Conference Tuesday edition of Locked On NHL, your team every day, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Thank you, as always, for tuning into Locked On NHL and making it your first listen each and every day. My name is Seth Topol, host of Locked On Wild, joined by my co-host Nick Morgan of Locked On Predators. Here's the rundown for today. We will be taking talking about Jonathan Taves who's taken a little bit of a break, but may or may not be done for good. We'll also discuss what we would change in the rule book if we became NHL commissioners for a day. And we'll look at the top 10 most improved teams in the West as we continue our rankings series. Nick, how's it going today? It's going good. Uh, It is inching closer to hockey, which means uh, inching closer to some big ticket stuff to talk about yeah we're uh we're just about well we're past the midway point of august and so september is going to be here before we know it labor day will be in the rearview mirror and then after that it is full systems go with training camp and preseason games and then regular season starts on october 10th mm. can't wait for that uh, and we'll be uh counting things down as we gear you up for it uh throughout the next uh several weeks. So uh, today we wanted to take a look at some uh, news that has been making the rounds here over the uh, last few days. We're going to start with Jonathan Taves, who long time member of the Chicago Blackhawks, iconic member of that franchise. He's taken a little bit of a breather and it isn't clear whether or not this is it, but not a lot of interest. For Taves, I mean, I think one of the probably likeliest things as we'll talk about is maybe a return to Chicago, but just kind of a quiet offseason for Taves. And look, he's getting up there in age, so probably not a bad idea for him to maybe just try to kind of rest up and heal up and see if anybody comes knocking as we get to uh, to training camp of the preseason. Yeah, and he also uh, you know, talked about some of the long COVID issues that he had battled and obviously that, that kind of derailed, uh, you know, his year last year in Chicago a little bit. It seems to be like that was kind of a concern, you know, for, for NHL teams. Like a lot of people just kind of weren't sure how healthy Taze was going to be. And obviously he, you know, he talked about that in his uh, message to the Blackhawks fans and just saying, Hey, look, you know, I really kind of want to get this, under control honed in I I think it's interesting because a lot of people just say you know I'm stepping away from you know right now or it's time to you know focus on health and whatnot the way he phrased it basically you know just making it very clear look I'm not retiring this really tells me that Jonathan Taze I I don't think plans on like this he doesn't want this to be the end like he wants one more run um, and it is interesting because I think a lot of people are kind of saying, you know, reading between the lines of, of what he said and saying, hey, this sounds like a guy who wants to be back with the Blackhawks. Yeah, it, it is interesting because you look at where he's at in his career and let's say it ends up being that he takes the entire season off to get healthy get himself to where he needs to be. It's not like he's not going to be doing, you know, anything he'll, he'll keep himself in, uh, in shape to be able to return, but it's, it's different looking at a veteran who maybe does that and takes a, a year off and then comes back as opposed to a younger player who steps away. You know, the example that I always think of is Andrew Luck in the NFL, where, He stepped away at a relatively young age and it might be a little harder for guys to come back and be at that same level, but 
Taves is a veteran enough that I think if he takes the requisite time to uh, to heal himself up and to just kind of get back to where he wants to be, Chicago is going to have a place for him because the one thing with Chicago is they are on the way back up. They're trying to kind of get themselves back to prominence in the Central Division and in the Western Conference, but it's going to be a few years before they are able to. And so it, I, I'm with you. I think they will just always be a spot for him if he wants to come back. A, a good veteran to put amongst the likes of Connor Bedard and and future draft picks that will be playing a big role on that team. It feels like they can just say, yeah, take as much time as you want. We've got a spot for you here when you're ready to return. I see this kind of going one of two ways because a, you know, we let's, let's not point out or like forget to point out that it was the Blackhawks who stepped up and said, Hey, we're not bringing Jonathan Tate's back. This wasn't like a mutual parting of ways or anything. The Blackhawks stepped up and said, Hey, we're not bringing you back. I see this maybe going one of two ways. Jonathan Tate said, Hey, at the end of the words he used were at the end, uh, closer to the end of the regular season. So I see this maybe going one of two ways. Maybe he steps in at the end of the year and just says, okay, what are some playoff teams that maybe need like one more depth piece? Like a player like me that can just kind of come in in the bottom six, you know, give some good minutes and maybe I get to chase one more Stanley Cup, which honestly doesn't sound too much different than what Patrick Kane uh, kind of said that he was going to do maybe considering, uh, you know, kind of doing the old uh, Brett Favre thing and wait until halfway through the season to figure out, yeah, I'll come back for another year. The other way is maybe if Taze really wants to be, you know, a member of the Blackhawks, he doesn't want to play anywhere else at the end of the season. Maybe he sits down with the Blackhawks and just goes, OK, like what what is there for me? And I think that'd be up to the Blackhawks because it's going to depend on, you know, what, you know, Connor Bedard is doing, how close that team is to competing. Um, I mean, if they have a bunch of, you know, center prospects ready to go and they think are NHL ready. Yeah, obviously, maybe bringing back Jonathan Taze to take up a roster spot isn't in your best interest. But, you know, let's say they still have some work to do. Maybe you go, okay, we got one one more year for you. We got one more year help lead this team, help develop some of these younger prospects, kind of be that transition in the locker room, and then be ready to hand off the reins. I see that those are, to me, I think the, the two ways this Jonathan Taze, uh, this Jonathan Taze news goes. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And this is something, obviously, that will unfold as the season wears on. But, you know, To quote a Major League Baseball example, Roger Clemens did this for a few years where he came back in like came back in like June for the Yankees and was like, yeah, I'll get I'll give you everything I have um, for the rest of the season. And that was enough for him for a few years. Granted, he was like he was like 45 at that point and was still pitching a little different here with Taves. But um, I I would imagine. Right. I would imagine. Well, but he did it. I would imagine if he opens it up at all, there will be some teams that would say, yeah, we'll take you as a third or a fourth line center. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, why not? Like if if he can still play. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I will say it's different than hockey or different in hockey, just because I feel like, you know, the NHL speed being game ready, but I mean, like, is it is it any different than, you know, like a player coming back from like a year long injury or something like that? Would this be any different than Gabe Landeskog coming back after his hiatus or right. Steve Sullivan back in the day coming back from a year and a half of injury? Maybe not. It's all about the shape that he keeps himself in to be ready uh, for that and eventual return. And so uh, we'll uh, we'll kind of keep an eye on that and we'll see how things play out with his uh, return eventually to the NHL. Now, Nick, what we're going to do when we come back is play commissioner for a day. Gary Bettman has retired and we're taking over. So we'll look at the rule book and some potential changes as we continue today's episode of locked on NHL after this. 
Our next partner has a product I use on an everyday basis. And the reality of the situation is this. AG1 makes it so much easier to get a ton of vitamins and nutrients in your system. You don't have to take multiple bottles of supplements or vitamins every morning. Lay out what you need to take and try to do that all while you're hurrying out the door to get to work on time. AG1 makes it simple with just one scoop in a glass of water each and every day, you are getting up to 75 high quality vitamins and minerals to put directly into your system that help you with everything throughout the day, including helping you keep your energy levels at an all time high. If you are looking for a comprehensive solution for your supplement routine, then try AG1 and get a free one year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash NHL network. That's drinkag1.com slash NHL network. Again, drinkag1.com slash NHL network. Check it out today. We continue Western Conference Tuesday here on Locked on NHL. Seth Topol joined by Nick Morgan of Locked on Predators. All right. Gary Bettman has retired. We are take for a day. He he took a long weekend, and so we get to go to the league office on a Monday and uh, make some changes to the rule book. This is inspired by uh, a Bleacher Report tweet that asked the following. If you could change one rule in the NHL, what would it be? I've got a couple ideas in mind, uh, but I, I think – We'll let you go first, Nick, and then I'll uh, I'll go with mine, and we can talk about some honorable mentions as well. Here's my biggest one, and I have been sitting on this for a while. Uh, <laughs> still, to me, maybe the dumbest rule in the NHL right now. Let's get rid of the trapezoid behind the net. Let's just let goalies handle the puck wherever. I mean, come on. Don't you want to see the goalies involved in offense a little bit? Like, don't you want to see somebody like Andre Vasilevsky skate to the corner, get the puck out of the corner, and just, you know, launch a pass down the ice? Like, don't you want to just see that? Isn't that fun? Wouldn't that just add some offense? You think back to, like, the 80s and 90s and just, like, how involved some of those players were. You know, think back to battling Billy Smith in the 80s. You know, then like Ron Hextall, Marty Brodeur, uh, Chris Osgood back in the day. You know, those are, those are players that, you know, they were not afraid to just skate anywhere, you know, beyond the net, you know, t- take a bouncing puck, maybe stop a puck in the corner, maybe dig a puck out, skate out and try to make a pass. You can't tell me that's not fun. And, in, in, you know, when they added that trapezoid, you know, the two minute delay a game for a goalie, Just touching the puck, you know, in that trapezoid area, number one, a lot of people have figured out ways around it where, you know, they'll like push the puck beyond their trapezoid, not touch it, and then, you know, hit it again when it's across the line. Just get rid of it. Let's open this up a little bit. Give goalies a chance to contribute offensively. That just makes the game more fun. You know who would like that rule tweak now would be Marc-Andre Fleury. He already yeah. enough does it where he had the um, he had the one play against Dallas in the postseason where he just came flying up the ice. He's done this a, a million times in his career. Came flying up the ice to try to disrupt a potential breakaway opportunity. Mm-hmm. And so if you allow him to do that kind of thing, but also then just wander uh, and go wherever he wants, he's he's going to have a good time. Um Wild have had a ton of goalies that just wander in the um, the last several years. I mean, Alex Stalock was one. Capo Kakinen, I'll never forget the photo of him squaring up to block a shot like 30 feet in front of the net just because he tried to do the same thing. And then a team, the team that they were playing was like, all right, well, we're going to let it rip then. Let the goalies roam. Let them have fun. Let them operate under the assumption that they can go wherever they want but then the net is open yeah like let it happen it's like you know i love those plays in soccer where you see the goalie 
just like, you know, catch the ball and just, you know, dribble it up to the half line or, yep. you know, he runs up to the midline to like be like a back pass of his team is pushing forward. Uh, I know I, I would love to see them do something like that. Mine is not necessarily a game rule, but mine is a format change. All we right. got it. We got to go back to the one, one through eight. I'm with you like 100% with you on that one. I, I just have never been a fan and probably because it has been something that the wild have struggled with the last couple of seasons. I've never been a fan of the interdivisional start. Yes, it does create some rivalries, but if you end up being like the third or fourth seed in the West, you should be able to play the equivalent opponent. Mm-hmm. Like I just, yeah, I, I'm, I'm frustrated by that. I'm frustrated by the point system. Like, why do we give, why do we give teams a point for getting a game to overtime and then losing? I would change it. I would change add the third point, like yeah. you know, three points for a win, two points for an overtime or shootout win, and then one point for like an overtime loss. You know, just incentivize. Mm -hmm. winning in regulation because i feel like you have a lot of player teams just playing for a point let's just get that kind of makes it boring incentivize trying to win it within 60 minutes i want to go back to the playoff thing because i'm 100 with you on that and i just feel like you know i I get it You're, you're trying to prioritize division rivalries and have that right off the bat i feel like it just kind of neuters good matchups late like, mm-hmm. you know, you think of, you know, some of the past great matchups and, you know, like, you know, Detroit and Colorado in the 90s and 2000s and Philadelphia and New Jersey, um, you know, just all of these great sort of end of season matchups where it was like, you know, easily like the best two teams in the division going head to head. That's how it should be. And now, you know, we've had some great battles, but I mean, think of all those times we had Washington and Pittsburgh in round two when they were above and beyond, you know, the two best teams or, you know, Tampa versus Toronto round one for two straight years. Like that is a matchup you could see late in the season. It, it just, it, it I feel like it neuters stuff. It kind of, I, I don't know. Like it, it feels like a lot of these matchups are stale now. Yeah. At least when you're kind of doing like the one through eight system. Yeah. You have your division, two division leaders up top, but there's so much, you know, room for, for cross promotion or cross whatever, I guess you call it across, you know, the two divisions. I just think it's fresher matchups. I think you have a chance at better matchups later as the playoffs go on. I'm all for that. 100% with you for that, Seth. And the other thing too, that I think has become a little frustrating. And part of this was the fact that the Boston Bruins took care of their business so quickly how far, how much of the season was left for that Toronto Tampa Bay series before that was locked in like two weeks? Yeah. So then you just, what, what are you playing for for the rest of the season? Like your, your matchup is already set. Whereas if you go one through eight, there's potential that you could drop or you could hop up. Yeah. I mean, it's, you had that matchup pencil in for a month. And I think that you're I think you're right. It's just, you know, they, they knew who they were playing. There really wasn't any incentive to, to try to make a run other than just, you know, who got home ice advantage. And, you know, when you're two good teams like that, even something like that can be a little bit overrated. Yeah. Um. The, the other one that I'll mention, this is just because I kind of want to to light this can on, on fire and just run. Let's go. Um, all or nothing for goaltender interference. Either figure out what it is or just get rid of it entirely. Yeah. Would would you would you bring back the the old in the crease rule? Like your foot's got to be in the crease. I mean, you've got to look at doing something because how many times did we see this past season where a goal looked good, it was challenged, and it turns out that or, or what we thought was goaltender interference, a player getting 
kind of slid into the crease and running into the goalie. And then they say, no, it's not actually goaltender interference. It's like pass interference in football. Figure it out Mm -hmm. or get rid of it. I think it should be simple. If the goalie is in the blue paint and there's contact, that's goalie interference. Set. Doesn't doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's he could be yeeted halfway across the ice. He could not budge an inch. If there is contact there, that's goalie interference. If the goalie is out of the net for any reason, if he jumps in to if he you know dives forward to block a shot and then he's just you know five people fall on him, he's out of the crease. That's that's fair game. Yeah. He went to go make a play. Got trapped up in players in front of him. The blue ice should be the goalie's ice. If there's contact there, goalie interference. It should be that simple. I don't know how it's not. All teams want is a uniform standard. There will be things, there will be calls that will come close that teams will disagree with. But if you have a set standard in place, then you say, well, by the book, that's what it is. No, it's not going to be perfect. Teams are going to get hit with it from a negative perspective. Teams are going to benefit from it. But if you just have a concrete standard of what it is, it solves a ton of problems. Right there with you. Yep. Well, that that now that uh, now that Batman's back, he's going to undo all of this. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And more more terrible TV deals. <laughs> oh boy, don't even get me started on those. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to go any further down that rabbit hole, but I'll tell you which rabbit hole we are going to go down, figuring out which teams improve the most in the Western Conference. We've got 10 worthy candidates for that honor. We'll discuss as we finish today's episode of Locked On NHL after this. Final segment of today's Western Conference Tuesday edition of Locked On NHL. Seth Topal, host of Locked On Wild, joined by Nick Morgan of Locked On Predators. If you haven't already, make sure to take the opportunity to subscribe to both shows so that you don't miss out on any Wild or Predators-related news as we move through the rest of the offseason. You can find both shows as well as Locked On NHL on YouTube and also your favorite podcast platforms. So make sure to take the time to subscribe so you don't miss out. All right, top 10 most improved teams in the Western Conference. Nick, we're going to have you go and then I will uh I will discuss the list. Yeah. So there are again some tiers here because we're only dealing with Western Conference teams. So there's some teams that make this list that didn't really improve. So I've got six that I think improved to varying levels. Uh, Three that I think mostly stayed the same. And then uh, one who didn't really improve, kind of took a step back, but is better than the other teams. So uh, number one, I think maybe in the entire NHL, the most improved team, I got the Dallas Stars. Uh, You know, you bring in Matt Duchesne, who two seasons ago, was a 43 goal scorer, 86 points. Now he's a depth guy. He is on, you know, a team with a lot of talent. That is a dynamo addition for the Dallas stars. Uh, number two, uh, I'd have to, you know, we, we kind of went on a tangent about this last week, but I got to go Chicago Blackhawks. Connor Bedard. Yeah. One of the biggest acquisitions of the off season. Uh, number three, I have Arizona Coyotes, a team that I think made a lot of savvy signings in the offseason. Some good depth pieces that I think will help them improve a little bit. You also get Logan Cooley coming in. That is going to be a big addition. Arizona, I think, is going to be a lot better than they were last year. Uh, four, a team addition by subtraction, uh, the Vancouver Canucks. You don't have Holifer and Larson and Ethan Bear on your blue line anymore. Uh, and you got decent replacements of them. Carson Susie and Ian Cole. Uh, number five, I have uh, Anaheim Ducks. A couple of good depth signings. Kalorn, Gudis. Uh, six, the St. Louis Blues. Pretty much the only thing they did was get Kevin Hayes, who's, you know, a fine player. Will help them, you know, depth. 
Uh, and then a seven through nine are the teams that I don't really think got better or worse. I have the LA Kings, uh, which is weird because you know they got Pierre Luc Dubois, but they lost a lot of other depth. Uh, the Winnipeg Jets and the Edmonton Oilers, and then ten, uh, the team that got a little bit worse, but maybe not as worse as some of the other teams. Uh, Calgary Flames. I like that you went this route with this list because I was going to say that there weren't there weren't a lot of teams that made real big splashes in the Western Conference this offseason. I mean, Pierre-Luc Dubois was the big move, but you bring up a real important point in that aspect is that they had to give up a ton to get him, and they also had a few other trades that they had to make in order to get that salary on the books. Mm -hmm. And so it was a big, high-profile acquisition by the Kings. But yeah, it's we're going to have to really see how things play out, and I still don't think that they improved the goalie situation to where you can say, yeah, that's, that's a clear cut, um, a clear cut winner of the off season in the Western conference. So I like that they're in that grouping of, are they better? I guess yeah. we'll find out. And, um, and in terms of that trade, Winnipeg, I think is the opposite. They get a lot of good depth players from that trade, you know, Kapari, Gabe Velarde, Alex, I follow, and it's almost the flip side. It's like, but then they lost Pierre-Luc Dubois, that one big, you know, kind of piece down the middle. So did they really get better? Yeah, I, and, you know, going to the teams that did improve, I, I'm really, really high on what Arizona did because mm-hmm. by the definition of this, they are substantially better than they were last year. Yeah. A ton of veteran help for that lineup. Logan Cooley also uh, thrown into the mix there. Um, so I, I think they definitely have to be at the, uh, at the top of the list. Um, it, it is interesting for me, just from my perspective, and I'm sure from your perspective as well, from our respective teams, I would, if I was putting Minnesota anywhere, I would put them probably at nine or 10. Mm-hmm. but I I'm I'm fine with them not being on the list because they didn't have money to spend. And the only players that they really brought in were the guys that um, they were able to resign and lost a couple of depth pieces as well. Pat Maroon, the only notable addition, really Stanley so, cup. Here we go, Minnesota. Yeah. Pat Maroon's coming. So I, I would put them, I would put them at nine or 10. I'm interested to get your thoughts on Nashville because they made a ton of moves, Ryan O'Reilly, other names that were, uh, that were brought in as well. And so a lot of action, mm-hmm. but based on not putting them in, I'm guessing you are kind of of a similar belief as to I am with my team. Yeah. I mean, but, but you lost Matt Duchesne and Ryan Johansson who are, you know, 25% of your offense from, from right. two years ago. Uh, and the, the thing with Nashville is, yeah, you know, they got Ryan O'Reilly, who's, you know, certainly going to help them. He's going to be an important piece down the middle. They got Gustav Nyquist from Minnesota uh, and they like, got Luke Shen. But, you know, you look at that compared to what they've lost both this off season and, uh, you know, since the trade deadline, would you really say Nashville's better? That perception may change if some of the, you know, the reason Nashville did this was to clear up space for some of their younger players to come up. Um, You know, maybe we're looking at this a little bit differently if somebody like Luke Evangelista or Cody Glass go off and become, you know, 60, 70 point guys. But for now, it's just, yeah, you got some good pieces, but you also lost a big chunk of your offense I don't know if you brought enough back in to be able to kind of offset that. Yeah, that's that's well put. And uh, that's kind of the question that everybody is asking themselves right now. But Dallas, I agree. I love that. Uh, I love that acquisition. And that just is a dangerous team regardless. So good off season for those 10. And uh, we'll continue our rank em series on next week's episode. But that's all the time we have for today. Thank you once again for making Locked On NHL your first listen each and every day. You can follow us on YouTube and your favorite podcast platforms. Make sure to check out more content throughout the week as part of the Locked On Podcast Network.